And now I would like to welcome me, Elena Batokova from the uh, Center for European Policy Analysis to join me on the stage with her panel on countering and deterring adversarial threats, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Well, uh, thank you so much. And um, good morning to everyone here in DC and in Brussels. My name is Irina Buketova, and I'm a democracy fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis. And I'm honored to be here and to moderate this panel discussion on uh, countering and deterring threats and uh, talk about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by our distinguished panelists, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Oksana Markarova and uh, Geospatial Intelligence Team Lead George Barris. Uh, greetings to you. And uh, uh, before we dive in uh, the discussion, I would like to um, have and to, uh, I would like to ask you brief questions on um, on this one year and three months of Russia's full invasion. How has your life been changed, and uh, what is the biggest takeaway so far? Your Excellency, let's start with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here with the uh, NATO Youth Summit. I don't think I can qualify as youth anymore, <laughs> but I really hope my country will qualify to be part of NATO. So, uh, you know, it's my life actually changed in 2013 when Russia attacked us the first time. And uh, it was a continuation of the all kind of hybrid wars that we experienced before. Uh, for nine years, we were looking for a diplomatic solution, even though we had all the signs that Russia is not looking for those solutions, but actually used all the time to prepare for another attack. And uh, this past 467 now days have been probably the most difficult days in the lives of every Ukrainian. Because not only it's very important for us as the country, it's existential actually for us. It's existential for everyone who believes in these values and would like to live peaceful lives. But on a personal level, I mean, to live in something that we all have read in the books or have seen in uh, movies about the past wars uh, became reality for all 40 millions of Ukrainians. Uh, your loved ones been under attack all the time. Your uh, houses, you never know whether it's safe or not for millions of Ukrainian children not to be able to study, not to be able to get proper medical care. Uh, but most importantly, knowing that, you know, it's, it's a make it or break it moment for us. And for my generation, it's uh, a very important war because we do feel that it's our turn in the Ukrainian history not to pass this war to our children. So we have to win this time. Thank you so much, and uh, Ambassador, you know, like, thank you for all, from all the Ukrainians for everything you're doing here you. in D.C. George, the same question over to you. So how has your life been changed uh, since the uh, Russia's full-scale invasion, and what is your biggest lesson so far? Because we all know probably in audience and online, uh, you know, we, we all see your maps, uh, dynamic maps, where you show the, uh, how frontline changes every day. So please share your biggest lesson. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, it was the February 23rd in the evening here in Washington when Vladimir Putin gave his early morning 24th in, in Moscow speech announcing uh, the, the war in Ukraine. But I think uh, the ambassador makes a great point that Russia's invasion of Ukraine actually didn't begin uh, 16 months ago, it began back in 2020, uh, 2014, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, we had, you know, when the initial invasion kicked off, we, we at ISW had already been tracking uh, Russian military activity in quite some extreme depth for quite some time. We work seven days a week. We're constantly watching the front lines, uh, forecasting Russian operations, uh, examining Russian vulnerabilities. But we actually had already begun our full-time seven days a week uh, schedule uh, following Russian military activity starting uh, in September or October 2021 because the Russian effort to actually array their forces around Ukraine and set the conditions for their large-scale invasion really began in earnest um, in August 2021. Um, so we had been thinking about this for quite a long time uh, and watching the buildup. Uh, with regards to lessons learned uh, and the big takeaways, uh, I think the key thing for me as an analyst was uh, to understand that you have to be very careful about checking your assumptions. Um, at the Institute, we forecasted that Russia would likely not invade Ukraine uh, because we looked at, in particular, at the way that the Russians had arrayed their forces. We looked at the command and control network or the lack thereof, the lack of logistic support. And we said to ourselves, this looks like we have all the components of a coercion co campaign, but not a successful military campaign with a large geographic 
uh, uh, goals uh, for their military objectives. And so we were wrong in the, on the big line uh, forecast. The Russians obviously did indeed attack, but we were correct in that um, this operation went very poorly because of all the uh, evident problems with the way that they had not planned for the war that they ended up fighting. Thank you so much for sharing, and uh, we will talk about Russian military capacities uh, further. I just want to share that, you know, as a million of Ukrainians right now, that's a year, uh, well, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, that's a year of losses for all of us because we are losing a lot of Ukrainians every day. Uh, but sadly to say in such a moment, that is the uh, moment of growth for all of us because it's our, uh, it's our fight for existence, for freedom, for democracy, and we will be fighting. Uh, you know, for me, uh, I just want to share my story. 17 years ago, I was first in the United States. I came here as a, a transatlantic fellow on the leadership program. I flew over from Crimea, from Simferopol Airport, and I came here to the United States. Then, nine years ago, Russia legally annexed the peninsula. And, uh, well, uh, last year, uh, when the full-scale invasion started, I had to take an evacuation train that went from Kiev to the western border. So this is, this is what happens uh, like during 17 years. And this is what happens, like the biggest takeaway for me is that if we don't stop the aggressor, the aggressor won't stop. So and from this point, I would like to ask the ambassador you, so what is needed to stop Russia's aggression and what will be sufficient for Ukraine to deter Russia's attempts to continue the war in future? Thank you. That's, well, first of all, again, there are several layers to this war. Layer number one is uh, Ukraine. We need to restore our territorial integrity. We need to deoccupy all the territory of Ukraine and liberate all our cities and villages, not only because of the UN principles and territorial integrity as the basis principle for how we all in the civilized world organize our living, but also because we all know what happens on these territories which are under uh, Russian occupation now. You have all seen uh, the scenes of Bucha and Izum and all the, and Kherson and all the places where we have seen that civilians are being tortured, raped, uh, killed, kidnapped, you know, the Ukrainian children are being, so it, it's again, it's a matter of physically saving Ukrainians from the brutal aggressor who realized, I think by now, that their assumptions, not only, uh, you know, the civilized world assumptions uh, that, but Russian assumptions have been completely wrong. You know, they, uh, we are a separate nation, we are a separate country. Uh, Ukrainians never wanted to live under Russian occupation. We fought against it during the imperial Russian times, during the Soviet times, and it, it, this, this spirit is no different. Uh, it's just that this is a rare situation in the period of Ukrainian history where we have had our independence for 31 years, and where since 2014, since Ukraine firmly uh, returned after the uh, pro-Russian or Russian even owned and led uh, government that was installed in Kyiv before, we had eight full years of uh, reforms, pro-Western, pro pro-European -Euro reforms, and we have started building from scratch, literally, our army and our institutions. Just eight years was enough to add to the will of Ukrainian peoples to fight the capacity to do so. And of course, with the help of the civilized world for which we're very grateful, we can do that. Now, what is necessary to do so? I mean, Ukrainians are capable of fighting on our own. We are not asking any of our friends to give us the personnel to fight. We still have lines of people who are willing to, to serve. We still have people who are willing to be trained uh, and to defend our country. So, the question what we need remains the same. Number one, priority weapons. You know, it's, it's very clear. I mean, nobody wants peace more than Ukrainians. I wish right now we were planting food and, and raising children and doing what we like to do most. But, you know, and we are doing that even during the times of war. But more weapons are needed in order for us to uh, get the Russians out from the country. Sanctions, very important. As we are doubling down on our... Uh, counter-offensives and liberating our territories, we also together all have to double down on sanctions and Russia isolation. We have to send a very strong resounding message. It's not just punishment for Russia. It's a resounding message that no, it's not okay in the 21st century 
to do that, to kill people, to torture people, to uh, cross the border of independent neighbor, absolutely not provoked, not because, you know, uh, there was some danger or whatever, unless, of course, being democratic and peaceful and European is a danger. And, and it's not okay, and we have to stop Russia, but we also have, have to send every sound and message to all other dictators who are looking at this and, 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 and making their, uh, their calculations ba based on what will happen here. And also uh, all, all, all other support to Ukraine. Uh, you know, because, again, it's important for us, but not only for us. Talking about NATO, Black Sea as a, a, a place that should be used and, and uh, belong to all the countries around it, not to be a Russian lake, is such an important element of transatlantic uh, security and the security infrastructure, not architecture, not only in Europe, but, but everywhere. The, uh, the transport corridors, the airspace control, I mean, you took any of the elements of that, free and independent Ukraine that wants to be democratic and wants to be a part of transatlantic family is a, an answer to so many challenges, not only created by Russia, but be, by other uh, potential challengers to the NATO alliance uh, and, and people with, who, who believe in the same values. So, I mean, the answer is like in multiple choice, all of the above, and I know it's a lot to ask, and we're very grateful for everything we have received, but actually in order for all this sacrifices of Ukrainian people, but also sacrifices of taxpayers in so many countries that are helping us in order to actually make it less needed in the future, we have to, we have to get more in order to end the war and in order to get to just peace sooner. Thank you so much for saying that and uh, like taking into account everything that we have, the situation right now on the battlefield and uh, our aspirations to join NATO one day. Uh, George, my question over to you is that, uh, well, you are uh, observing what is going on on the front line every day. Uh, that's your daily routine. And uh, what are Russian military uh, capacities these days? Uh, what do you see there and uh, how secured is the eastern native flank? And uh, just while you're answering, I will ask to, if you have the questions here in the audience to line up near the microphone near our western flank. Yeah, over to you, George. Thank you. Uh, the Russian military is in a very precarious situation right now because if I had to use one word to describe the Russian military, it is degraded, degraded. Uh, the Russians actually began facing an acute combat power crisis in May 2022. I want to dispel any notions. There is no prepared reserve force that the Russians have that is clean, that has not been tapped, the red horde that they're waiting to just release, and that's their trump card. It does not exist. Because of the way that the Russians set up their campaign, they've already cannibalized their military. Uh, they've tapped every single one of their maneuver brigades and regiments to create uh, ad hoc assault units, which were wasted uh, in a very, uh, and frankly, a way that actually goes against Russian, their own doctrine that the general staff has developed. Um, we know that the Russians are all out of these clean forces because they've had to resort to pulling in the volunteers and conducting a partial mobilization in September when really Putin should have done it back in May. Uh, we also know that the Russians have also resorted to using uh, human wave tactics with uh, tens of thousands of pardoned prisoners uh, that are told to fight for their freedom or, or die in prison. Um, we also know that Russian morale is quite low. Uh, they spent the last six months uh, using what few elite elements they had remaining within their military, uh, conducting quite fruitless uh, offensive operations. Uh, really starting since uh, December, maybe January, we saw elements of five or six Russian divisions um, some of their elite forces, their airborne forces, okay. uh, conducting offensive operations in Luhansk Oblast on the Svyat of a Krimina line. Um, they made extremely tactical gains, if any at all. And then, of course, uh, the Wagner Group with Yevgeny Prigozhin, he's burnt all of his combat power and his bridges with the Russian General Staff and Ministry of Defense in extremely attritional fights for the city of Bakhmut, which has no tactical and arguably lost its, uh, its operational significance. Um, after the Ukrainian forces liberated Izum in September. The Russians would have been much better served if they had actually conserved uh, those Ragnar forces and those five or six divisions in order to consolidate their gains and actually uh, prepare to defend against Ukraine's summer counteroffensive. 
Um, so right now, the Russians are in a very vulnerable position, and they've actually done Ukrainian forces a favor uh, by setting themselves up to be uh, exploited by the upcoming counteroffensive. Thank you so much for sharing the latest updates. I will just say that you know Ukraine needs to liberate all the occupied territories because uh, that territories are used by Russia. You know that uh, since 2015, uh, Russia conscripted over 30,000 uh, Ukrainians in Crimea into the ranks of the Russian army, and definitely there are uh, volunteer ba ba battalions right now in Kherson or Zaporizhia Oblast, which are newly occupied. So that is why it is very important to liberate that territories. Uh, definitely, we have a few questions online, but I just want to start with uh, our audience here. So please, the first question here, I just want to make sure that we will uh, manage to ask all the questions. So that is why I ask you to be brief. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Jacob Levitan. I'm a Johns Hopkins Science class of 23. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the end game of the war, uh, ensuring that there that there can be a peace settlement that will prevent a renewal of the war 5, 10, 15 years from now. Uh, how vital do you see taking back Crimea, for example, as ensuring that the Russians cannot uh, renew or start a second war or a continuation of this war, how, depending on how you look at it? Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador? Um, I, I'll respond very quickly with uh, President Zelensky's 10 step peace formula. So the end game for us is very clear, you know, to liberate all Ukraine. And Crimea is no different for us than from any other oblast. So for us, it has been since 2014, always talk about all Ukraine within the recognized international borders, by the way, recognized by Russia too, when in 1991, when 92% of Ukrainians voted to be independent everywhere, including Crimea. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, getting our country freed, returning all the Ukrainian people justice, you know, so all the international courts, three of them, where we have cases, all the now more than 90,000 criminal cases inside Ukraine, 24 countries that have their own prosecution. So yes, we would like to have Mr. Putin and all these war criminals uh, indicted and, and uh, uh, prosecuted um, according to the uh, very fair judicial process uh, for what they have done from the crime of aggression to all the war crimes in, in Ukraine and then rebuilding of Ukraine, which again, it's not only for us uh, a, 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 an exciting project to create new innovative Ukraine, leapfrog into the future, but also Ukraine that can be a solution to so many global problems created by Russia or existed even before, you know, food security, energy security, uh, and, and everything else. And plus, uh, let's not uh, remember, forget that after this, Ukraine will have one of the strongest battle-tested armies uh, that, that will be uh, instrumental for, for the countries with uh, the same principles. So yes, for us, the future membership in the European Union and future membership in NATO is not something that is in our constitution, our inspirations, but also that all the majority of Ukrainians believe and will do everything in order to continue to reform our country to be able to join both. Thank you so much for the question. Just one, one question from online, Ambassador, over to you because it's, it follows the same topic. Does NATO's plan to have Ukraine join NATO after the war incentive for Russia to remain in Ukraine? Uh, say it again. So does NATO's plan to have Ukraine join NATO after the war incentive for Russia to remain in Ukraine? Well, in 2008, Georgia did not intend to join uh, uh, NATO and there was nothing in any of the constitution. In 2013 and 14, Ukraine was still neutral. That didn't stop Russia. So let's not fall for this uh, pure Russian propaganda, essentially saying that whatever they do is somehow response to uh, NATO enlargement. First of all, I think we should stop using the word NATO enlargement. NATO doesn't enlarge. It's the individual countries that want to be part of that system that join it. Finland join it. Sweden is about to join it. Ukraine would like to join it. And uh, uh, I just think, you know, we have to completely stop, you know, responding to this false narrative because what Russia has done, not only to us, not only to Georgia, but to Moldova, to Syria, uh, poisoning people on the streets uh, in, in Great Britain, shooting down MH17 uh, from the skies. They've done all of that simply because they are aggressive, totalitarian, imperialistic countries that do, do not believe in the same values, do not believe in rule of law. And everything we do, we just have to do uh, based on the principles and values and the national security agenda that all of us have 
individually, but also where it coincides, we have together, and this is what it is. So again, uh, I, 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 I think, you know, whatever we can do in order to be together, stick together with the like-minded countries is actually, will, actually that what it will bring peace rather than, you know, provoke or not provoke Russia to do something. They've already done everything bad without any provocation. Thank you so much for the reply. We have nine minutes left, but I want to make sure that we hear all the questions. Please, over to you. Hi, thank you. My name is Carlos Kuskovics. I'm from the University of Maryland, representing Latvia today. Um, I have another question for the ambassador. Um, so all eyes are on the upcoming NATO summit in Vilnius, in Lithuania. Um, unfortunately, some indicate that full membership for Ukraine is not currently on the table until uh, it was hopefully a clear Ukrainian victory in the future. But um, are there any specific steps that you want to see from the NATO summit? Um, and what does, what does Ukraine want to see? Thank you. Well, as I said, you know, our aspiration to be part of, of NATO, the 2008 uh, summit clearly said that there will be a uh, way that the, the NATO doors are open. Uh, we just, you know, again, we're realists. We understand, you know, that we're not asking anyone uh, to apply Article 4 now, and we're not asking anyone to fight for us now. We're asking for the help so that we can fight this war. But in general, I think all the summits is a great opportunity for all of us together to discuss not only uh, the confirmation of the previous statement that Ukraine, that the doors are open and Ukraine could be, but that Ukraine will be and, and how we can get there. So uh, we're looking forward to this summit. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you. And George, one question over to you from our online. To be fair, how will Ukrainians receive proper training with these weapons without per personal? So basically, you talked about the uh, capacities of the Russian army, but what are uh, Ukrainian army capacities, and do you think it's possible? Yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, the United States and NATO, we have training infrastructure within continental Europe. We have training infrastructure within uh, North America, where Ukrainians have come to train. Uh, Ukrainians train on patriots within the United States. Uh, Ukrainians are training, uh, and they're conducting unit-level uh, collective training uh, in Germany and in other places, uh, within the UK, of course. Um, so, actually, the rate determiner for Ukraine to train and become effective on these weapon systems isn't actually, I think, the, the bodies, and it's not the hardware, it's the political decisions. Because the unfortunate fact is that for some of these more sophisticated weapon systems, there are necessary long logistical uh, requirements that have to be spun up, and it takes X number of months to make your, your uh, recipient host uh, operational on that particular system. For example, I think the Pentagon has the estimate that it's going to be four months for the Ukrainians to become, uh, Ukrainian pilots to become operational F-16s, for example. But the unfortunate thing is that it's actually the political making decisions that are uh, the main deterrent, and rather the main thing that slows down making Ukraine operational on various different systems. Uh, for example, I, I see no compelling reason why, if you look at the list of all the various weapon systems that NATO members have uh, pledged to give Ukraine today, Abrams tanks, Leopard tanks, Strikers, Bradleys, uh, NASAMs, HIMARS, uh, Patriots, uh, and now upcoming F-16s, I see no compelling argument for why Brussels and Washington could have made the same determination that it's okay to send Ukraine all this equipment any later that after Ukraine had demonstrated that there are cunning warriors and they defeated the Russian effort for the decapitation strike against Kiev in April 2022. Instead, we've actually debated every single one of these big ticket items for many months at a time. And then we agree, it's okay, we can send them this thing. And then the debate you know, uh, progresses to the next big ticket item. And that process, the policy debate process of months punctuating every single one of these systems when really they're going to be most effective, and the Russians develop less antibodies and less counter tactics to actually reduce their effectiveness uh, is increased when the delivery is staggered. Thank you so much. Our Western flank, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Kirby, and I'm a student from Georgetown University. My question is, recognizing that Syria has been referred to as a testing ground for what is occurring in, Rus in Russia and Ukraine now, what similarities and differences can you draw between the two conflicts, and what lessons can the U.S. learn today cool. from Thank a geopolitical you, and um, political perspective? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in that region, to be honest. I only noticed, you know, mentioned Syria because this is uh, how Russian 
military and uh, you know the paramilitary groups that uh, work for the Russian government essentially destroyed and did the military operations, whatever they call it, but essentially killed innocent civilians and, and destroyed the whole uh, residential areas there. So we have seen that war crime there, but. Uh, Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. George, maybe you? Sure, I, I can tag, tag on very briefly. Wait, wait. From the military side, the Russians took a lot of lessons from Syria, but they were the wrong lessons and applied them in Ukraine. For example, one of the big reasons why the, uh, the Russians did so poorly with their initial invasion is because they didn't follow their doctrine and they doubled down on using an experimental unit formation called the Battalion Tactical Group. And the Russians used the Battalion Tactical Group extensively uh, and previously in smaller combat in Ukraine in 2014, but also in Syria. Um, and there's actually a very interesting and technical discussion one can have about what tactics and what military operations worked in Syria, how the Russians said, ah, that worked in Syria, therefore we can upscale it by a factor of 10, and it will work in Ukraine, and it did it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that we have or one or two questions left, please. Sure. Uh, Doug Klain, I'm with Rosam for Ukraine, and I'm a fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Ambassador Makarova, later this month, Indian Prime Minister Modi will be here in Washington, and he'll be giving an address to a joint session of Congress. What role do you hope to see India take in helping to end Russia's war in Ukraine? Thank you. Well, we do have, uh, on the one hand, uh, a club of really friends and allies, strategic friends and allies, who have been uh, always seeing this war for what it is, an aggressive, un unjustified, unprovoked war. But we also work with the wider group, uh, especially within the UN, and we're trying to uh, reach to everyone who is a member of UN and who believe in, in UN statute. So I think it's very important for us, and our president had already conversations with Prime Minister, uh, several of them. Uh, it's very important for us uh, to have India uh, on the peaceful size, which means for just and lasting peace, which means that we all together have to join to say a resounding no to Russia and ask them to stop their aggression. So uh, India is one of the countries we are extensively talking to about it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I think that we have to wrap it up because we have only two minutes left, but I just want to have, uh, you know, like closing remarks on your main message to audience here, to all the leaders who are here and online. George, over to you and then to Ambassador. It's very important that uh, NATO and its future leaders take, uh, take the not incorrect lessons away from Russia's uh, disastrous invasion of Ukraine. The Russian threat to NATO's eastern flank is not defeated and completely over within Ukraine. Russian Minister Sergei Shoigu in January articulated intent for Russia to recreate a Soviet-style military. He stated his intent for the Russian army to create uh, 12 new maneuver divisions. Uh, and this means that really the Russians seek to reconstitute, they seek to rebuild. They're not d over in Ukraine and therefore NATO needs to think very seriously about what the security architecture and landscape will look like, not in the next year or two years, but five to 10 to 15 years. Thank Be you. Belarus Ambassador, is also de facto you. occupied. Thank you. Ambassador. Well, every war requires uh, intent, window of opportunity and, and capabilities to do so. And we have to believe Putin and everyone in Russia when they say what their intent still is. To recreate the Russian or Soviet empire, which not only includes Ukraine, but a number of NATO countries. So it's in our vital, uh, uh, you know, it's existential, vital for all of us, not only to stop them while it's still in Ukraine, but also get to the strategic win of all of us and strategic defeat of Russia so that uh, we actually can live in the safer place. And when we win, that work will not end. We have to reform the whole global infrastructure, which actually did not prevent this war. So like the League of Nations did not do it before the World War II, unfortunately, even though 143 countries condemned Russia for it, right. even though in March 2022 the court mandated them to stop it, they didn't. We have to change that too in order to save not just Ukraine, but others from the future wars. Thank you so much and thank you so much for everyone who is here. Thanks to NATO and to the University of Marie and William. And uh, we will close with a video from NATO about its commitment to Ukraine. We will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. We will not back down.